Hey everyone and welcome to the Microsoft Sucks edition of the Linux and open source news. Because not only do we have VS Code dropping Ubuntu 18.04 support without any warning as an auto update, but we also have Microsoft Edge grabbing data from Google Chrome without any user consent. We also have Fedora KDE who could potentially reconsider dropping X11 and we have a lot of improvements to Wayland and to Wine on Wayland as well. And we also have this message from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Tuxcare. They provide solutions for enterprise Linux fleets to ensure that they're kept up to date and supported with as little downtime as possible even when the distro you run is end of life or you're working with multiple distros. And one of their main solutions is Kernel Care Enterprise, a live patching solution that lets you apply security updates while the kernel is running without disruptions, meaning you don't have to reboot systems or plain maintenance windows, which often delay the application of these security patches. And if you want to learn more about Kernel Care Enterprise Live Patching, well, you're in luck. All you have to do is click the link in the description below. It will take you to all the resources Tuxcare has on live patching to explain what it is, how it works, why it's important, and how you can automate it. So if you run one or many Linux servers and you would like to make all that maintenance and security work easier by putting patching on autopilot, just click the link in the description. So VS Code, Microsoft's IDE, decided to drop support for Ubuntu 18.04 LTS as they now require a newer version of glibc than the one the old LTS provides. This obviously created a bunch of problems because a lot of people are still running a bunch of 18.04 servers which are still supported by a free Ubuntu Pro subscription and they can't remotely access these servers anymore when using the latest version of VS Code. Now, upping the requirements for your app is absolutely normal and 18.04 is almost six years old and only in extended support and two LTS have already been released since then, 20.04 and 22.04, and there's a new one about to drop. But Ubuntu 18.04 is still supported by Ubuntu, and it looks like Microsoft did not communicate on this change, so no one could prepare, and the update was applied automatically for most users. So a lot of users just noticed this when trying to connect to a remote server, and they had that connection just fail. Now, obviously, you can still downgrade to an older version of VS Code, or more drastically, you can update your server to 20.04 LTS or higher, but that is not an ideal situation. Or, you know, the other solution could be to just not use a Microsoft product. It's a company known for abusing their dominant position, for just invading their users' privacy, limiting what they can do, and generally just not caring about who uses their software. There are plenty of other IDEs out there, especially open source versions of VS Code, which, to be honest, haven't really said if they were going to apply the same update or if they were going to work around it. And Microsoft has also been caught red-handed as Edge seems to use Chrome's browsing history without any consent from the user to restore your Chrome tabs inside of Edge. The Verge reported that they never imported any data into Edge, they never used it. And still, the browser just opened out of the blue, as it always does on Windows, with all their Chrome tabs in it and they only noticed it was Edge because they weren't logged into any of these websites. There's technically a setting to handle this in Edge, but in this case it was already disabled. Other users are reporting they're experiencing the same behavior on their own devices, with a prompt asking them to allow this, then crashing and disappearing, which Microsoft seems to take as user consent. And all this data, while it is technically stored locally, will be sent to Microsoft if you're logged into a Microsoft account and you haven't disabled this data being synced with the cloud. Which means that basically on most Windows systems where it's super hard to install the OS without using a Microsoft account, well, Microsoft is just taking users' browsing data and uploading it to their servers without any user input. Yeah, Windows is just wonderful. I am still baffled why the browser choice ballot is no longer a thing because it wasn't tied to the fact that Internet Explorer at the time was a dominant browser. It was tied to the fact that Microsoft had the biggest market share on desktop operating systems and they still have that. So they should still offer a choice out of the box for users. 
Now it looks like Fedora 40's decision to drop X11 entirely from the KDE spin isn't set in stone just yet. While this decision has been voted on by the steering committee, there are new review requests being posted to reintroduce a KWIN and a Plasma package to support X11 again. The KDE team for Fedora is proposing instead to have these in a copper repo for those who really want X11. But this would also mean that first you would have to add that repo manually and second support wouldn't really be on the same level as a native integrated Fedora package straight from the official repos. Now on top of that Fedora 40 announced that the network install images would no longer be constrained to their 700 megabytes limit which is the limit to fit those images on a standard CD. The size of the firmware that you kinda need to include to boot the image uh, is just too high. So Fedora will allow themselves to exceed that 700 megabytes limit and the end result is that the network image will not be usable on a CD anymore. But is that really an issue when most people would use a USB drive or at the very least a DVD drive? Now personally, I hope Fedora won't back down on their decision to drop X11. Fedora is the perfect distro to implement these kinds of changes. They've always done that first and before other distros. And I think it would also give a huge test bed for Plasma 6 on Wayland, for Wayland on Fedora and for Wayland in general. Adding it as a copper repo would be absolutely fine in my opinion. Now there are some good news for Thunderbird users. Thanks to implementing Rust in the app, they're going to be able to add native support for Exchange, meaning that you will be able to use Thunderbird more easily in various companies that decided to go with Microsoft products and services. It is all done using a Rust crate that will of course be open source as well. On top of that, they're finalizing a revamp of the cards view for the email module of Thunderbird, which should not only look better, but also be a bit more legible, especially for conversations. And finally, they're also revamping the whole message database, which uses a pretty old framework that's a big limit to what they can actually do with this message database. It's going to take a while to make that change, but it should result in a lot more flexibility, in better handling of threaded conversations, and probably in some performance improvements, so that looks like a good move. So it's great to see Thunderbird evolving again, not only in the UX department, but also on the backend side of things. Their 115 release was already a big hit, but if they keep on that road, yeah, Thunderbird is going to be just awesome for everyone. Now, Wayland support in Wine is improving again, this time with another set of features, notably display mode change emulation. This will let games run full screen on Wayland without using the native display's resolution which is obviously an important feature, especially if you would want to use stuff like DLSS or FSR. The merge request will probably land in Wine 9.2. And the developers plan to add a bunch of features in 2024, including support for window minimizing, because they have everything related to window management except that. They want better OpenGL support, better handling of the clipboard or just handling of the clipboard period, drag and drop, and a few other things. Collabora has a blog post that listed everything they accomplished in 2023 and what they want to work on in 2024. And the work they've already done is pretty big. They have basic window management, software rendering, mouse support and mouse look for FPS, keyboard support including handling of specific key mappings and specific keyboard layouts, support for Vulkan through Wine's implementation or DXVK, and basic support for high DPI. And other things they would like to add at some point in the future are support for the upcoming HDR protocol for Wayland, plus auto DPI detection to handle high DPI displays correctly, plus per monitor handling of scaling in Wine directly. And still on Wayland, while some Wayland protocols generate a lot of discussion, some are also quickly agreed upon. Well, I say quickly, but this one has been in discussion for the past nine months, so it's not exactly fast. But still, the top level drag protocol has now been merged, which should solve a bunch of issues with dragging tabs out of windows and spawning new windows from them, or reattaching tabs to windows. It will also let various dockable components work as intended, which could be cool for KDE as they have a lot of that in their applications. Kwin, Chrome and the Qt framework already implement a version of this, but this protocol should make things more streamlined and unified across desktops and toolkits. 
Now, I will admit I never encountered any issue with dragging a tab out of a window, whether it's a browser or file manager on Wayland, whether it was in GNOME or in KDE, but apparently some apps just didn't work well with that, so it's good to have that fixed as a normal protocol that every desktop can implement. And it looks like Red Hat's recent moves to limit who can access their source code has repercussions on their wider ecosystem now. Certain special interest groups, or SIGs for CentOS, are reporting issues, notably the Kmods SIG, which is focused on building additional packages that contain kernel modules for extra hardware support for CentOS Stream, one of Red Hat's distributions. They cannot legally produce these packages anymore due to the licensing changes, and thus their packages are no longer updated. They're apparently working with Red Hat to try and solve that issue. The Hyperscale Special Interest Group, which is meant to enhance CentOS Stream for big infrastructures like those used by Meta, Facebook, Twitter and the like, also has some issues, and they decided to now build their packages using Fedora's kernels instead of the CentOS and Red Hat kernels, as they just cannot legally redistribute the source code from Red Hat. So yeah, it is clear proof that Red Hat is tacking on additional limitations on top of what the GPL authorizes, which is against the GPL itself. So I hope these licensing changes will be considered contrary to what the GPL allows and they'll have to walk them back. Still, it's insane to me that Red Hat's moves are actually hurting their own ecosystem. For everyone who wants to use CentOS Stream and has specific needs, SIGs might no longer work, which is a big blow to CentOS Stream, which in turn might be exactly what Red Hat wants because they might prefer that people use Red Hat Enterprise Linux instead. And let's finish this with the gaming news. Holo ISO as we know it is now dead. It is replaced by an immutable distribution. The non-official SteamOS rebuilt encountered a bunch of issues over its lifetime, which resulted in very few updates over the past year. And now it's been archived and replaced with an immutable distribution, which is apparently already usable day to day. The old builds that I currently run on my own sort of SteamOS console will no longer receive updates, and users are encouraged to move to the new distro, Although there is no direct upgrade path yet. The devs want to add that, but they don't know when it will happen. There's now a new GitHub repo to download that new build. Now the Mesa drivers got a new major release, version 24. You can expect a lot of improvements for AMD GPUs, with much faster ray tracing support and support for a lot of new Vulkan extensions. And the same goes for Intel's Vulkan driver. Mesa 24 also brings a lot of performance improvements to NVK, the open source Vulkan driver for NVIDIA GPUs, and it also brings a new shader compiler to go with it. The Azahi graphics drivers also got OpenGL 3.3 support, meaning that using Linux on an Apple Silicon Mac should feel a bit better. On top of that, there's an open source Vulkan driver for PowerVR graphics found in a lot of ARM devices. Although it will not get an OpenGL driver, this will be handled through Zinc, which basically brings OpenGL through Vulkan. So yeah, really solid updates here, and Mesa 24 will probably land just in time to be included in Ubuntu 24.04 or Fedora 40, meaning that in a few months, a lot of people might actually be able to daily drive a fully open source stack for the NVIDIA GPU. So I'll be expecting a bunch of benchmarks from websites like Foronix, and if none come, I will probably just make my own in a video. And it looks like the Linux market share on Steam has sort of plateaued as it dropped slightly to 1.95% at the end of January, down from 1.97% at the end of December. It is not a significant drop, but it is no longer growth either. macOS fell as well, down to 1.54%, and Windows is still at more than 95%, 96.5 actually. Holo ISO or SteamOS are still driving Linux's market share at 42.12% of Linux systems being used to game, which also means that AMD represents 70% of the CPUs used to game on Linux, where it's at 35% on Windows. And it's really interesting stuff because it shows that Linux's gaming progress is completely tied to the Steam Deck, 
If the Steam Deck stops selling, our market share will plummet. If the Steam Deck keeps growing, it's gonna keep growing for Linux in general as well. But it's also not a great situation to be in because we're basically just relying on one single company and one single product line to actually gain market share in gaming and get developers on board with supporting Proton or adding anti-cheat support for Linux. So I do hope Valve at some point starts creating partnerships with other brands to ship other SteamOS uh, images and other SteamOS devices. So there's not just one company taking part in the ecosystem and they just spread the love around. And since we're on the topic of devices, let's talk about our sponsor, Tuxedo Computers. Tuxedo makes laptops, desktops, and NUCs that ship with Linux pre-installed. All the hardware they use has been picked specifically because it is very compatible with Linux. And in their testing of these computers, if they encounter any problem, they submit patches upstream so everyone can benefit from the fixes. They have a huge range of devices from Ultrabooks, from NUCs, from gaming PCs, workstations, gaming laptops, whatever. They have everything for all price points and all use cases. All the hardware is pretty customizable, especially on laptops where you can have your own keyboard layout, your own logo, and you can open the laptops, repair them and upgrade them. Tuxedo computers is all I use these days. My SteamOS console is a Tuxedo Q PC. My main computer that I use to run the channel, edit videos and do everything is a Tuxedo Infinity Book Pro 16. So yeah, I can only recommend them. And if you need a new computer and you plan to run Linux on it, just click the link in the description and check out Tuxedo computers. They're really good. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, you know what to do. Click the like, the subscribe, the bell notification thingy, leave a comment, whatever. You know how this works. And if you really enjoy the channel, there are plenty of links to support it. And if you become a Patreon or a YouTube member at any tier, you will get a daily Linux and open source news podcast, whether it's on YouTube or on Patreon. So check that out in the description. In the meantime, thanks for watching. And I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.